therefore the wrath of God is the wrath of God is revealed before no therefore the wrath of God is on is on, upon thee from the Lord. From before the Lord. From before the Lord. Thank you very much. First Chronicles First Chronicles, no, Second Chronicles chapter 19, verse 2. Let's give him a round of applause. That was a very good attempt. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We are going to read it together after the count of two. Second Chronicles chapter 19, verse 2. It's on the screen. One, two. And Jehu, the son of Anani, Seir, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly? And love them that hate the Lord, therefore is wrought upon thee from before the Lord. Second Chronicles chapter 19, verse 2. Our text will be taken from 1 Kings chapter 22, from verse 1 to 53. First Kings chapter 22, verse 1 to 53. We're going to read a few verses. We'll first take verse 1 to 8. We we'll go to verse 14 to 18, and then we we'll take 30 to 37. Let's take one. Chapter 22. And they continued three years without war in Syria and Israel, as the Lord liveth. And it came to pass the in Lord the third year me, that Jehoshaphat the king of Judah came down to the king of Israel. And he came to the king, and the king of Israel said unto his servants, Micaiah, no shall we go against Ramoth Gilead, Gilead, Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria, go and prosper. And he said unto Lord, Lord shall deliver it to the Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? to him, and Jehoshaphat How many times shall I assure thee that I am as thou art, but that my which is true in the name of the Lord, my horses as thy horses? And he said, And Jehoshaphat I said unto the king of Israel, Israel Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord, she that had have not a shepherd. Then the king the of Israel said, gathered the prophets together, no about four hundred men, let them return, and said unto them, to his house, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, Israel, or shall I forbear? Jehoshaphat. Take it from here because of our time. First Kings chapter 22, verse 1 to 8. And they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat the king of Judah came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth Gilead in Gilead is ours, and we, and we be still, take it not out of the hand of the king, and we be still, and take it not out of the king of Syria. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Will thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. And the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about four hundred men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or should I, shall I forbear? And they said, Go up. For the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides, that we might inquire, inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. If you go to verse 14, to verse 18, and Micah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord said unto me, that will I speak. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee, that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills, as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master, let them return every man to his house. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that you would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? And if you go to verse 30, And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle but put thou on thy robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. 
but the king of Is Syria commanded his thirty and two captains that had ruled over his chariot, saying, Fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king of Israel. And it came to pass, when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat, they said that they said, Surely it is the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. And it came to pass, when the captains of the chariot perceived that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture, and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot, Turn down her hand, and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day, and the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians, and died at even. And the blood ran out of the wound into the midst of the chariot. And there went a proclamation throughout the host about the going down of the sun, saying, Every man to his city, and every man to his own country. So the king died, and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. Praise the Lord. Amen. This is the a summary of the story we are reading today on Jehoshaphat's unequal yoke. Jehoshaphat was a king of Judah, and he was a righteous man. But the time came, he went to make a league. He went to collaborate, associate with another king, King Heab, the king of Israel. And God was not happy with this partnership because it was an unequal yoke. If you read from where we read, you know, um, in, um, in verse 2, the Bible said, Jehoshaphat, the king of Israel, came down to the king of Israel. You can liken that to somebody being up, and you're going to, you have to go down and stoop so low to meet uh, the ungodly Ahab, and God was not happy with this. It was an unequal yoke. And when we talk about an unequal yoke, we are talking about partnership between God's children and unbelievers. We are chosen from the world to be God's peculiar treasure, hence we must not copy the ungodly practices of sinners or enter into intimate relationship in them, be it in marriage, in business, in worship, or in whatever way. Pray the Lord will help us and keep us in Jesus' name. We we'll take the first question. What should be the believer's relationship with unbelievers? What should be our relationship with unbelievers? We're going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, from verse 14 to verse 16. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 to verse 16. Brother Ima, could you please read that for us again? 2, King, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 to verse 16. Do not be unequal yoke together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be with their, with their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come up to 16, right? Yes. Okay. Here we see that uh, we should not be partnered with the be on equal yoke with unbelievers, and we should not partner in whatever they are doing. Both yeah. in marriage, in relationship. So God wants us to be stay clear from. Thank you very much. I like that word stay clear. The word wants us to stay clear, not to conform to them, not to join them in anything, in their practices or in association in business or whatsoever. We go to the first point Jehoshaphat on equal yoke with Ahab. It was not as if Ahab was a secret sinner. Ahab was clearly a sinner, and he had a record of idol worship, of wickedness, and covetous practice. So for God-fearing Jehoshaphat to join himself with him in marriage, in business, and in military affairs, it was clearly an unequal yoke. And still today, God frowns at such relationships. When a believer becomes involved, associated, or in partnership with an unbeliever, it usually results in the believer 
compromising the faith and destroying the relationship with God. It's easier for somebody to pull somebody down than to lift up. So we must be very careful about this. We take, we go to the second question. Mention some causes of unequal yoke. What leads to unequal yoke? Let's take a few texts. Um, we're going to take First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Professor Daniel, could you please read that for us? And then we're going to have um, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. Sister Susanna, could you please read that for us? First, First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Do not deceive. Evil communications corrupt good manners. What causes it here? Evil communication. Yes, evil communication. And communication there means association. Evil lead. When you associate with the wrong people, it leads to, it's actually unequal yoke. Proverbs 29, 25. Uh, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso feareth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Yeah. So here, um, it's uh, fearing man instead of God. So you listen to man as opposed to listen to God. Thank you very much. Yeah, you are not. You are afraid to say no to the person because you are afraid of the person. You say yes. He says let's do this, and beca maybe because the person is powerful or something, you associate yourself with the person. We must be very careful, and God will keep us in Jesus' name. We take the third question. Mention some biblical characters who were involved in unequal yoke. Who were Bible characters? who were involved in unequal yoke. We're going to read one text here. First Kings chapter 11, verse 1 to 3. Let's have somebody online. First Kings chapter 11, verse 1 to 3. Brother Femi John, if you are there, could you please read for us? First Kings chapter 11, verse 1 to 3. If you could unmute your microphone. First Kings 11, one to three. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with his daughter of Pharaoh, women of Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Of the nations concerning the, the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall them come in unto you. But surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon cleave unto this in love, and he had seven hundred wives princesses and 300 concubines and his wife turned away his heart. Thank you very much. Yes. Who is the character there? Solomon. Thank you very much. It was Solomon. And there are many other examples in the Bible. In Ezra chapter 9 verse 1 to 3, you see the people of Israel, the priest, the Levite, associating themselves with, with the Eden nations. Uh, Joshua was a land today is another example. So he was very careful to about this. We go to the second point, Jehoshaphat's counsel for divine guidance. Jehoshaphat's counsel for divine guidance. Jehoshaphat told here to ask the Lord before proceeding with the intended war with Syria. And this is commendable. He knew that he, wa he, he was a righteous man. He wanted God to lead them. So he asked Ahab to inquire from God. What did Ahab do? He asked 400 self-appointed prophets. They were false prophets. And as predicted, as expected, as you would expect, they told him, go for the Lord will, will, will give you victory. And then Jehoshaphat went again to Hab, you know, to ask again, is there not any other prophet here? And then he mentioned it, uh, Micah and he said, but I hate him because, you know, he will, he will always uh, say, give me an evil prophet. It, and that was a true prophet. Micah warned him, but he imprisoned Micah for telling him the truth. And from there, from the life of Micah, we learn that we must be courageous. We must always be able to tell the truth to people and not be afraid of their faces. Let's take the fourth question. What can we learn from Micah's uncompromising stand? Micah's uncompromising stand. Galatians chapter 1. Verse 10, Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Sister, Sister Justina, if you're there, please, can you read for us? Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Okay. 
Okay, we'll go to the church. Um, yes, I'm here. The volume is very low. I'm trying. <laughs> Sorry. Volume is very low, sir. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Okay. Uh, Brother Tony, could you please help us? I think the volume is low online. Yes, sir. Galatians 1, verse 10. Yes. Okay, sir. For I... For do I now persuaded men or God, or do I seek to praise men? For if yet persuade men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Thank Amen. You. Amen. So from what do we learn? Amen. Amen. What do you learn from Micah's stand on that place? What must we do? Or what must we not do? Amen. 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 That's the Amen. All right. Um, from where Sister uh, Justina read, we see that we must seek to please God and not men. At all times, whatever the situation is, we must always please the Lord. And the final point we read, uh, the final uh, point is Jehoshaphat's narrow escape and the death of Ahab. Jehoshaphat went with Ahab to battle despite God's warning. A strong tie with wicked Ahab and their royal affinity blocked his perception and obedience to God's word. He nearly took the dead blow that was meant for Ahab. The dead that was meant for Ahab, they nearly killed him. If not, that he shouted and God saved him. It is dangerous to get involved in a venture with an unbelieving fellow who has no regard for God's word and does not follow godliness and righteousness. The final question is, how can believers involved in unequal yoke escape divine judgment? How can believers escaped in, involved in unequal yoke escape divine judgment? But Ayoka, could you please, um, we're not reading, if you just tell us how a believer involved in unequal yoke can escape God's judgment. What did, does a believer need to do? Yes. So if you obey the word of God, you will, you will escape the divine judgment. Thank you very much. You must obey the word of God. First, you must come, you repent of that unequal yoke and come to the Lord and return to him for pardon. And you must break off those ties. I pray the Lord will help us to do that in Jesus' name. From what we read, uh, learned today, um, Jehoshaphat's unequal yoke, we see that God hates compromise. He hates unequal yoke in friendship in fellowship, in association, in business, in marriage. It is dangerous to partner with someone who has neither regard for God, nor follow God's godliness and righteousness. Let's say that again. It is dangerous for a, to partner, for a believer to partner with unbelievers, somebody who has no regard for God, who does not follow godliness or righteousness. Sinners also need to know that living in disobedience to God's word only attracts his frown. Hence, the urgent need to repent because repentance is the only way of escape. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to ask the Lord to, to help us. Joshaphat nearly lost his life because of unequal yoke. We're going to pray that the Lord will keep us. He will keep us from association with unbelievers in marriage, in business. The Lord will keep you. He will keep me. He will help us to stand firm. Pray that the Lord will give you courage like Micaiah had courage. The Lord will make us courageous to obey God, not to please men. 400 prophets prophesied falsely, but he stood his ground. And he told the king the word of God. Let's pray that the Lord will help us. any question from our service sisters today? If you have a question, please uh, 
You can just lift up your hand and ask or unmute your microphone so that we can hear you. What business did you hear for? Any question? Let's open to 2 Corinthians, please, chapter 6. Now, one thing you will look, uh, you will see in the life of this man, uh, Jehoshaphat. Uh, let, let me just throw it to you. Um, who, who was Jehoshaphat? Uh, what was his status? Uh, his status is in society. Uh, he was a king. Eh? He was a king. Uh, and he was a righteous king. Uh, and generally, people move with others in their own status. Uh, so as a king, he needed to fellowship with somebody who was a king. Y do you, are you following me? Uh, and that's the, where we find ourselves sometimes. Uh, you say, well, I cannot just fellowship with anybody um, because for the king, just you need counsel, you need friendship. Uh, you can't just go and say, well, uh, yeah, my servants. Uh, it was like a difficult thing. And when you look at yourself, maybe you are in that stage of your life or in that status and you find it difficult to find friends. Let's look at what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. The Bible says, Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion has light with darkness? Now, the Bible is talking about fellowship between a believer and somebody who is an unbeliever, who doesn't, who is not born again. Uh, fellowship with someone who is born again and somebody else who is not born again. The Bible says don't do it. Now, what kind of fellowship is that? Well, it's talking about worship. Uh, we don't go and begin to worship together and we say we are praying to the same God and this person is not born again. We don't say that we are going to get married together. You are born again. This individual is not born again. You don't say that we join our capital together to go and start a business, and this man or woman is born again, and you are not born again. That's what the Bible is talking about. But then you come to the practical question, the practical uh, difficulty of the believer. And the believer says, well, I'm the only person. Look at Jehoshaphat. He needed somebody to fellowship with. And Israel, of course, he didn't go to the Amorites, he didn't go to the uh, Canaanites. He just said, well, Ahab, yeah, that's the best I can find. And then he went. That is where God is now calling you to extra sacrifice. Since you may not be able to find Somebody like you that you can easily uh, relate together, then it is, if that comes to you, the Bible says we condescend, we lower ourselves. That's a price to pay. Instead of going to Ahab, who was a king, and then they could relate to kings. You understand? I mean, if you want to have friends, uh, you know, as a king, you say, a king is my friend. You want to have a, a, you know, maybe you are a lecturer, you are a doctor, you have a professional. And I say, I want to have friends. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's my colleague. It's my, we can speak the same language. When we talk, we have the same issues. Kings have similar issues. If you are a head of state and I'm a head of state, you can relate together and to say, well, I'm having this issue in my country. How do you do that? And, but for the children of God, God says, there is a dividing line because this individual is going to influence you negatively. You, don't come, you can discuss together, you can talk together, you can you know, exchange things together, but it should not come in partnership. It should not come in, into marriage. It should not come into worship. And this is what this man went to do. And that's what caused the problem. 
Because evil association, evil communication will always corrupt good manners. So maybe here you are, you are a graduate, educationally. And you are looking around, well, I want to get married, but I don't see a graduate that is a Christian. What do I do? Or, you know, I'm a professional. I'm working in this kind of place. I don't find a, a professional to get married to. I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, but all the people around, I cannot find a single person that is, uh, that is a person that is single, that is also, you know, at that level. What do I do? That's where we need to pray. That's the situation that Jehoshaphat found himself. And you as a believer, you now begin to pray, God, how do I handle this? It may mean that God says, don't worry, condescend. You may not find the person that is at the same educational level, still I'm going to find somebody for you to get married to, the person that will do your life good. I'm not saying that it is always like that, that, well, if you, if you are, uh, you know, you have a PhD, and then you go and marry somebody who has not gone to school at all, uh, there will be some issues. Yeah? Because uh, you come and you are talking and, uh, and you are saying, uh, maybe your friends are talking and other people are talking and you are talking about you know, research, other things, and then uh, maybe the, 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 you are the wife, you have a PhD, and the husband has not done as much, uh, uh, and the husband says, what thing then they say now? Uh, so it could become a little bit embarrassing. That's what I'm talking about. But I'm saying here that this man had that peculiar issue. But that you cannot find somebody to relate to at your level is no excuse to go and begin to do unequal yokes. We should ensure that we go to the Lord, we keep the Lord's commandments, and we pray. And you seek for counsel. Uh, that's why we have leaders in the church. You ask questions. I said, this is my situation. What do I do? And the Lord is going to grant us answer of peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you follow me? Is it clear? What have I said? Who can summarize what I said? If you can summarize it, please lift up your hand. Or oh, I call somebody at random. Who? I understand. Thank you very much. But I want you to give me a summary of what I said. Our brother has said, birds of the same feather, they flock together. So you will be like your friends, basically. Uh, now let's now bring it into the context of what we just explained. Yes, right, Jonathan. Please uh, walk to the microphone and, uh, and, and let us hear you. Learn that uh, it is not proper to associate with the unbeliever as a Christian because okay. it can corrupt the person. Thank you. And or, the, or the person can go astray. The person can go astray. I, 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 and then the peculiar issue that I mentioned. What was the peculiar issue that I mentioned? Like uh, getting married with a. No, no, what I mean is that in your. Like a, a Jehoshaphat, you know, Jehoshaphat had a peculiar issue. What was his issue? I, I Ah, <laughs> you, you switched off a little bit. Yes, sir. Ah, no, then I caught you. <laughs> God bless you. Uh, so who, who, who didn't switch off? <laughs> online. Who, who is online? Who wants to tell us? Okay, can I try? Yes, please. Uh, go on. Yes, sir. Uh Birds of the same feather flock together. This is normal and nature for everybody. However, in certain cases, you may find yourself uh, just like, like I am here as a student in a foreign land, trying to mix with different people. I may find it difficult to find someone with my kind of philosophy, kind of, uh, and also as a Christian, but that he, I may need to take extra steps and then condescend you to see if there's someone which is not in my own status as at that time that can also, 
I can also play along with this a specular issue. It's not a, it's, it doesn't always work like that, but as a solar panel, I must ensure I did not make the wrong decision. Thank you very much. So we, we understand now. So you may find yourself yeah, like you are the, the lonely person there as a Christian. And the, the temptation will be strong to say, okay, if I cannot find Christians like myself, uh, if you are in Rome, do like the Romans. Then the Bible says, be careful, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And for every believer who wants to be kept, you will be kept. Even if you are the only person in your family, you are the only person in your company, you are the only person in your trade, you are the only person in your environment, in your neighborhood, you will stand because you believe the word of God. Let's rise up to pray. Let's commit ourselves into God's hands that God will help us so that practically the things that we understand from Scripture will be able to keep them. Let's pray. go to the Lord in prayer. Let's continue and commit what we've heard that the Lord will help us to be wise. We will not decide or make decisions based on our status or would examine and what is what is the right thing to do. Bible says, he that walks with wise men shall be wise, but the companion of fools shall be destroyed. And it is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That that will be the basis, the yardstick, the, 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 the very reason with which we use to judge and assess our relationships. Let's ask the Lord, oh God, help me. Wherever I find myself, I will be on the lookout for people that fear you. People that have the wisdom of God, that have the mind of God. People that regard you, that reverence you. At work, in school. The courage and boldness sometimes you might be in the minority, you might be left out from all the information, but let's pray, Lord, if that is what it will take, because I want to please you, because I want to honor you, I want my life and my relationships to bring glory to you, help me to live it out. And let's also pray, as you are here today, let's commit the church of God in this land before the Almighty God. This is his church. The gates of hell, the Bible says, shall not prevail against it. The Lord says he will build it. Let's ask the Lord, oh God, we pray. Lord, build your church. Help our leaders from our general superintendent right down to our national overseer, all our pastors, all the workers. Let's pray for the hand of God upon them, the strength of the Almighty that as they are out there, uh, the Lord will bring help their way, the counsel that they need, the encouragement that they need, the support that they need. The Lord will not leave them alone. It will not be lonely for them. Help will always be at their beck and call. They will not walk alone the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the insight, the illumination, the clarity they need, Lord, grant unto them. And as people under their watch, let's ask the Lord that we will continually encourage them, support them, not put pressure on them in the name of Jesus.
pray for yourself as you are here this morning. What do you want the Lord to do to, to you and for you? What is your expectation? I have not come here to mark the time. This time is an appointment with God, the King of Kings. You've come to seek audience before the King of Kings. And like we are saying, Lord, grant the petition of our hearts. Whatever the challenge might be, Lord, give me understanding. As your word comes, help me to see the relevance to my situation. And give me the courage to make the changes where necessary. All our invitees, those who ought to be here, who haven't connected, let's pray the Lord will bring them. No one will miss out of the blessings of the Lord today. For in Jesus' name we pray. You would receive now a tiki request for our tithes and our offering. And if you have it here physically, you can also raise your hand as we give unto the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father, we are grateful. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your counsel. We thank you, Lord, for how you warn us and challenge us and many times as well chastise us. We pray for the grace not to be hearers alone, but doers of your word in Jesus' name. We pray that, Lord, even as you have granted us the privilege to offer unto you, let this token be received and acceptable in your sight in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you've answered. In Jesus' name we pray. You can now give. And uh, once you've done that, you may have your seat. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Are we happy to be in God's house? Sound very chilled. Is it because of the cold weather? Praise the Lord. We thank God for bringing us into his house. This is God's house, God's family, and we come together to feast on God's food so that we can be nourished and become a glowing fold. Do we have any newcomer in our midst, especially for our brethren online or here in the church? Any first-timer newcomer? Please feel free, raise your hands. Let's meet with you. Let's know you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We have a newcomer in our midst. My sister, please rise on your feet. Shall we give a clap offering to the Lord? <laughs> My sister, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. Please, may we know you. You can come to the microphone just in front. Please feel free. Yeah, in a safe place. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. My name is Esther Bia. Esther what? Esther Bia. Esther, Esther. Yeah, I came with my guitar and I can listen. Thank you very much. Praise the Lord. What do we say to our sister? You're welcome, our sister Esther. The Lord bless you as you come, and your time here will be a blessing indeed in Jesus' name. You can please have your seat. You would get a slip to fill from our ushers. Please feel free to share um, as much information so we can continue to keep in touch with you. Our meeting days, um, we meet here every Sunday at 10 o'clock. That's when the service starts. And we also meet every Tuesday for our Bible study and Fridays for our revival hour. So on Tuesdays, we meet at 7 o'clock. And for our revival hour, we meet at 7.30 those meetings are online, um, and the number to connect is on the screen. For our brethren in Twi, they also can follow, and they also have their Bible study at 8 o'clock. The number is on the screen as well. It's the number you use to connect to the Zoom services on Sundays as well. And every last Friday of the month, we have our national vigil, which is also at 7.30. And I pray that as you fellowship with us, you continue with us, the growth that you desire and all your heart's desires, the Lord will grant in Jesus' name.
We have some announcements for our women. Praise the Lord. We have the National Women Conference coming up next month, the 2nd of October. And the time is 11 o'clock in the morning. 11 o'clock, the number to connect. It's an online meeting. It's on the screen. It's still the same number we use for our services. Let's connect. Let's invite our brethren. The flyer will be shared um, digitally, so we can pick it up, post it on your WhatsApp, WhatsApp status, or even use it as your profile picture, so you can spread the word. It's going to be about health. It's also going to be about wellness, and there's going to be a medical practitioner who will facilitate, take questions. So it's going to be a wonderful time, and we encourage you all to be part of it, and you'll be blessed in Jesus' name. We now go to our Bible reading. We'll be taking that from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 to 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 1 to 8. Chapter 5 It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. May the Lord bless the reading of His word in our hearts in Jesus' name. Yeah. On our feet as a worship this morning. Oh, my God. 
Christian, walk carefully. Christian, walk carefully. Danger is near. Christian, walk carefully. Off will thou fall. If thou forget on thy Savior to call. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this morning. We thank you because your word is life, your word is truth. We pray as we look together at your word, the Holy Spirit will minister to us in Jesus' name. We thank you because you have answered our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank God for how far he has led us in the service of today. And uh, a special welcome again to our sister who came for the first time. We pray that we make you a blessing in Jesus' name. We are looking at something very important in the Word of God today. Uh, the danger of a little leaven, a little yeast. Uh, we all know uh, what yeast is used for uh, in life in general. Sometimes, uh, many times, the, the Word of God uses simple, simple elements of life to teach spiritual truths. And that's what we want to look at today. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, from verse 1 downward. We see a church here. Uh, this is talking about a particular church. Now, sometimes as believers or as human beings in general, uh, everybody says church is church. Or some people say church is church. There is no difference. Look at, but in the Bible, the Bible doesn't say so. The Bible tells us different kinds of churches. When you go to Revelation, there is a particular place in chapters 2 and 3 of, uh, of Revelation. The Bible talks about seven different churches. And Jesus Christ didn't say they were all the same. Some of the churches, Jesus Christ said, yes, you are a gracious church. Two of them. The others said, no. You, church is not, you are not like the other church. So God compares between those who call themselves churches. There is a comparison. And it's God that makes the comparison. So you cannot look at one church and say, hey, church is church. Church is not church. And then we come to this particular church. Look at the recommendation, the, the observation of God, the report of God about them. In verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And that was the church. In the, in the church in Thessalonica, the Bible didn't, didn't say so. In the church among the Romans, 
Nothing like that. They had their different peculiarities. But this particular church, fornication. And why? Well, the place where they were, the environment in which they were, it was a kind of environment where fornication was normal. In fact, they could just call somebody or a place, that is Corinth. It was almost synonymous to immorality. Like nowadays, they will tell you it is so, so, so to be immoral. I don't want to mention that nationality. Yeah, but when they mention a nation, they will say it is so, so, so to be immoral. Yeah. And, and, that, and that, that is what we see. And the church now copied the lifestyle around them. Or rather, they brought what was happening in their country, they brought it into the, into the church. The Bible says that is living that we should not allow to be in our midst. In verse 6, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven, a little yeast, leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, as our Passover, is sacrificed for us. In other words, God wants the church to be different from the world. We cannot copy the people around us and then say that that is the place where we are living in. Whether we are in Europe or in any other place, the church of God is meant to be different, to be like God, not to be like the world. And when you look at this uh, thing, we are talking about the little leaven. The Bible talks about it in different areas. Uh, here we have seen immorality, but look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, reading from verse 1. Luke chapter 12, verse 1. The Bible says, In the meantime, when they were gathered together, when they were gathered together, an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, First of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Which kind of leaven should we be aware, beware of here? <laughs> hypocrisy. Eh? That means when I'm in church, I'm something outside church, I'm another. Or I want people to see me the way I am not. Eh? To the people that look at me, I present a picture. But actually, I am something different. That's hypocrisy. Uh, and we also see other areas. Look at, uh, we have look at, uh, we have look at sin. Let, let's see from Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 9. Galatians chapter 5, verse 9. The Bible says, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now, how did he come to this? Well, in verse 1, it says, Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now, here he's talking about the, the level of legalism. Uh, you have been saved by faith. The grace of God has come into your life, and now the thing you want, somebody wants to bring you back into bondage. Uh, if, you, if you're in this particular period of your life, you cannot come to church uh, because you're unclean. Or if you want to, uh, to get to heaven, you must go on holy pilgrimage to a particular place. Or you must pay some money to a particular priest. All kinds of legalism. Uh, don't eat this, don't eat that. Christians should not eat that one. Christians should not eat that one. The Bible says that is not what saves you. We focus on the grace of God. So that when somebody is bringing that kind of thing into the church, that is um, a level. Uh, it can be also, uh, we have looked at uh, the hypocrisy, we have looked at uh, sin or immorality. Uh, it can also be something like false doctrines. Yeah, somebody bringing false doctrine, I say, well, this one is just a little one. The Bible says, once that thing gets into somebody in the church, and it is not removed, it begins to spread, and it can destroy the whole church. That's why 
God has a recommendation for us, rather a commandment for us. Look at it in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. What should we do about, um, about this leaven? The Bible says there is only one thing to do. In verse 7, let's all read it together. The first part, one to go. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Now, that's it. What do we do to leaven? We just purge it out. We just take it out. If you keep it, it will, it will destroy the whole body. Uh, I pray God will grant us the wisdom that we need so that we will not be condemned in Jesus' name. Uh, I just want to look at uh, two points today. Uh, number one, sin and sorrow through deadly leaven. Uh, it's so dangerous. Sin and sorrow through deadly leaven. And number two, safety and security through decisive living. Uh, there is the, this little leaven. Mm, it, is, it is bad. It is evil. And it, it will cause sin and sorrow. Uh, that, that, that is how dangerous it is. We cannot just assume that, uh, just leave it, it will die out on its own. No, the problem with living is that you don't need so much of it. Uh, only a little. You put there and it will spread. It is enough to, to destroy anything. Many little things we are tempted to, you know, just overlook. They are the ones that grow up into big destructive things. Uh, look at an analogy in um, Matthew chapter 13. Uh, sometimes when you say, well, of course, this one is a, is a little thing. It can be very destructive. Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto Levon, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal. What happened? Till the whole was Levon. Eh? When you talk about three measures of meal, you know, in, in, you put it, uh, maybe you talk uh, three kilos or three whatever measure you have, and you put it in one, in, one, in one container, and just put a little leaven. I have not, never seen somebody, you want, to, you want to bake, and then you go and buy one kilo of leaven. No, it's just a little. Even when you buy, you know, uh, our women know those little sachets of, of yeast that you go and buy in the supermarket. You put, uh, maybe you want to make meat pie, or you want to make cake, or whatever you want to make. I say, I just put one kilo of the, of, the, of the flour, I put there, and then I take a little yeast, just a little, and then you put it inside. And then you lump the things, you just leave it. After some time, you see it, will, everything is going to, to blow up. That is how it is. So it's very, 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 very destructive. Eh? A, little, a little bad seed will spread into the entire field. I just, I just want to show you a, a number of illustrations of this. Uh, if you just sow a little bad seed, with, before you know, the whole field is polluted. In Matthew chapter 13, look at verse 24. Matthew chapter 13 from verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept. His enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tears also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then are these tears? He said unto them, what did he say? An enemy has done this. During, when we are doing the sowing, during the day, you take the whole day and then you do all the sowing. And it may take you, your household, everybody, a lot of man hours. But when the enemy wants to sow the seed, he comes in the night. Nobody sees him. And he's not coming with a whole group. No, just take a few seeds and sow here and there. And then nobody knew anything. But by the time everything was springing up, where are these from? An enemy has done this. That's what it means when we are talking about a little leaven, a little lust will corrupt the heart. He eh? may say, but this is just on the internet. This is just, uh, I'm just looking at this, is just on WhatsApp, uh, you know, video. And a little lust. Eh? Because the Bible says, ye have heard that it was said, ye shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whoso looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already in his heart. Whosoever looketh on a man to, to lust after him has committed adultery already in, his, in her heart. So what goes for the man goes for the woman. It's just a little lust. I will show you from the Bible. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, 
2 Samuel chapter 13. If you don't purge out the leaven, it becomes very, very destructive. In chapter 13, verse 1, 2 Samuel 13, 1. And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister, whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for who? For who? What do we call this? Incest. Incest. Can this be from God? No. no. God is not the author of confusion. Uh, for, she was, uh, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemir, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. Now look at the influence. And he said unto him, why art thou, being the king's son, lived from day to day? You see what lust did to this man? It entered him, and it began to grow, and he became lived from day to day. A little lust. If at the beginning he had purged it out, it would not have been like that. But then, I don't know what to do. You know what people generally do? They, they become sentimental. I can't do anything about it. This man is coming. A little lost, it will destroy a whole life. This man eventually died. He was not the only one that died because of this kid. Eventually, his own brother died. Uh, uh, th th this is what happens when we allow lust in our lives or a little leaven in our lives. In James chapter 1, James chapter 1. Uh, maybe as a married man, uh, somebody, a woman comes around uh, and he says, uh, I, you are looking nice. And he says, thank you. That's all right. But he says, oh, um, are you married? <laughs> oh, yes, uh, by the grace of God, I'm married. And you know, unbelievers, they don't, they don't know what the grace of God is. So when you say the grace of God, that's for you. It's not for the unbeliever. I say, okay. Uh, we know you Christians by the grace of God, and he, she, she changes her language. You Christians by the grace of God, uh, uh, but, but you are different. You, you look very, very smart. I say, praise God. And then, uh, uh, which church do you attend? And all that. So, okay, I also, I would like to go to your church. It's a good church. Um, uh, uh, let's meet, meet at McDonald's. I say, okay, there's nothing wrong with it. McDonald's, and you go to McDonald's, you go once to McDonald's, then you go to Burger King, and before you know it, you are exchanging a uh, picture, WhatsApp message. And before you know it, your wife cannot look at your telephone anymore. Before you know it, you are daydreaming about this woman. What I have looked, what I have, uh, I mean, what I have observed is that when you want to sell, when you are looking for hotel accommodation, and you look on the internet, they are going to present, they are not the worst room to you. Have you ever observed that? Or maybe it's only I alone. They are going to look at the best room. You know, when you get to the hotel, you won't get that room. You understand what I'm talking about? Some pictures that you see, some houses that you see, when you look at them on the internet after photoshopping, this is wonderful. Uh, haven't you bought some things on the internet? You looked at them. You say, hey, sister, this place is good. And when, when they finish delivery, you say, what is this? This is different from what I, That is the way human beings are. When you are looking at, for a woman to seduce or for a man to seduce, you bring you the best out for yourself. You dress well. You do all that. You talk nicely. And oh, well. Hey, brother, I just met you. You don't know that this woman has destroyed many other people. The tongue is fiery. The tongue is destructive. And then you are dreaming. You say, yeah. And then you get home. Maybe when you get home, you meet your wife at the kitchen. And at the kitchen, people don't put on the... You know, when you see our sisters who sang here, that's not what they take to the kitchen. You understand now? And then you look at it. my wife. Why is she so old model? This one that I ate with at McDonald's, that is dressing for the McDonald's. You are caught. James chapter 1. I pray God will deliver you. Amen. So you destroy it right from the beginning. Verse 13. The Bible says, 
let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. You are not going to say, it's God that brought us together. If God, if God knew that this one was sinful, he would not. No, 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 no. You have your eyes to see. Verse 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his what? Of his own lust and enticed. It may be a little lust, but then the Bible says, when lust has conceived. Uh, hey, wait, 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 don't, don't, don't rush. When a woman conceives, what happens after some time? You deliver. If, if lust conceives, what do you think all lust, lust will do? It will deliver. And sometimes it delivers twins. Sometimes triplets. That, that's the way it works. So you, you, you don't let, you don't even allow the lust to gestate inside you, if you understand what I'm talking about. If you don't understand biology, you don't, you don't, you don't allow it to nest in, in your womb, in your spiritual womb. What do you do? You purge it out. You do abortion. That is the kind of abortion God says, don't even wait for the morning after. Do it the same, in, in the, the same time. That is the kind of abortion that God recommends. Because if it conceives, it is going to deliver. And you begin to nurse it. Eh? Sometimes you are nursing it, and then the thing is becoming bigger and bigger. And you are saying, look at my belly, the grace of God. Oh, Lord, I don't want to, to destroy this thing in the name of Jesus. I know you have brought this person into my life to be a blessing. And you are married. It, the Lord will deliver. God doesn't want us to do that. You will not do it in Jesus' name. The Bible says, then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Do you see that? That is the what is the what is the offspring? What is the son? What is the baby of lust? Sin. And sin, when it is finished, what happens? Bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. You should not err. You should understand what the truth is. A little pride will eventually make a great fall. That's what happened to uh, Eve. The enemy came to her with the forbidden fruit. Ah, this one will make us wise. People don't understand that things that start little generally become big. Uh, projects that start big, many of them, they collapse. But projects that start little by little, before you know it, after some time, they become big. When the enemy wants to make you to fall, he will not come with a, a big, mighty weapon. You also, I mean, when we were, those of us that came from the village, when you were in the village and, 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 you, and you want to kill a bird, I, I know it looks like uh, animal rights people will not understand this. You take your catapult or something, and then you go. If you see the thing on the tree, how do you approach it? You take a, you say soldiers and everybody, oh, everybody march on. What do you do? Gently, gently, gently. The lion is very strong. And there can be about ten of them or six of them or seven of them looking for the prey. You don't begin to run just aimlessly anyhow. If you see the way those lions very, very carefully, carefully, until they are very close, and then they strike. That is how lust does. It doesn't come and say, I am lost, so I'm going to kill you. You see the process? Lust, it will, it will do that. Uh, a little level. It will, it, when it, it will conceive. The same way, the pride, when it comes, it comes very, very slowly. And then Eve said, oh, this is nice. This is nice. Many of the things, covetousness. When you go on the internet, you have clothes. Well, your wardrobes cannot contain them anymore. The same pride, it comes in lust. And then you look on the internet. Some people want to be like dolls. You know the dolls they use to put clothes on eh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the market. You look at this doll is very beautiful. Then you forget you forget that you have other ones at home. It is the one that is outside that is more beautiful than the ones you have at home. 
Maybe you have 30 or 40 at home, but the thing is busy. Busy. <laughs> That, that is what, the only thing you are thinking about. You will not understand. If everybody is now talking and saying about, you know, spiritualism, you, you have forgotten that the thing is of the heart. That's what destroys is. Amen. A little pride will eventually make you fall. Just one sinner will pollute an entire congregation. Look at 1 Corinthians. Let's go back to our text, 1 Corinthians. Sometimes people say, well, let's have love in the church. And where else should we have love? We should have love in the church. Love does not mean sinfulness. Love does not mean that we break the commandments of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I read from verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And not such fornication as and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife, and ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from you. Do you, do you, do you, do you see the problem? In verse, um, I read from verse 6 now. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaven the whole lump? They left that man there. And Paul the Apostle said, you can't do this. Don't you understand that this leaven is going to destroy the entire church? The same thing happened in Joshua. There was a man called Achan. Do you remember him? In Joshua chapter 7. He went and took the across thing. And nobody knew. And then they went to war. And the people perished. Many people died. And God said, I'm not going to be among you. I cannot say. But it was, you can say, but it's only one person that said. If he sinned, that's his own problem. No. The problem of Achan is the problem of everybody in the church. Because there are people that cover Achan up. And God says, as long as there is Achan in your church, I will not be there. There will be defeat. That's why all of us together will say, maybe you know somebody who is called a believer. And he's doing something that you know this is not right. You say, well, it is between him and God. It's not just between him and God. God has allowed you to know. And then you are saying, well, maybe God is going to give the, the church revelation. You have information and you are waiting. Uh, you know what happened uh, to, to the people in the time of Joshua? The people already died. It was when people were dying, when people died and they, they lost the battle, and they, they, they were saying, Joshua fell off. You see what's happening? If he knew that the first time, he could have prevented the death of other people. And these people, you know, it's, it is reported in, in commonly. Some people went and gave report that, Paul, something, something is wrong in our church. This is what has happened, that there is fornication. And Paul said, hey, I have heard this report. I didn't get this one by revelation. It's by report. And then he could do something about that. He could take action. Maybe as a church, we take action. We say, well, this is not what we want. Maybe somebody is bringing worldliness into the church. Somebody is bringing this other one in the church. And then we say, and we know. And then we say, well, uh, pastor. Uh, what? And pastor says, uh, sorry, uh, uh, this one I can't accept. It may be in the leadership. It may be a minister. It may be a pastor. It may be a worker. It may be anybody. And we say, hey, sorry. We talk to the individual. No, uh, this is not what the Bible teaches. And we don't want it to be like that. And well, so it's between me and God. It's not just between you and God. I, we don't want any Achan in the church. Step aside because the church must be pure. That's how to purge it out. So if we do not do that, one Achan is going to destroy the entire church. Just one sinner will pollute the entire congregation. A little root of bitterness is going to defile many. Just one little root of bitterness. Look at it in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I read from verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. And what happens? And thereby, are we reading together? Many be defiled. Do you see that? Root of bitterness is going to defile. We don't want to have that. A little fire will destroy an entire body. Just a little fire. 
Just a little fire. Look at James chapter 3. What kind of fire is that? Some people think uh, it's the one that, uh, you know, the fire brigade will come. I will show you. James chapter 3 from verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. If in the church everybody will become pastor. Eh, I have an opinion. No? Eh, I have an opinion. No? I have not said, wait, <laughs> brethren, what's going on? Be not many masters. Otherwise, we will have many condemnation. And we will enter into condemnation. This one is interpreting the Bible his own way. That other one is interpreting it the other way. Hey, don't be many masters. In verse 2. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. Even so, the what? My brethren, the what? The tongue is a very, very large member. Is that what the Bible says? It's a little member. And boasted great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindled. And the tongue is what? It's a fire. The tongue is a fire. A world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members. And it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it setteth on fire of hell. That's what the tongue does. If you don't purge the thing out, the tongue can destroy you as an individual. It can destroy your family. It can destroy the entire church. Some people have destroyed their own marriages just by their tongue. No devil or anything. It's just the word of their mouth. Some people are in, under a curse just because of the word of their mouth. And God is saying, Brother, sister, watch this little member because this little member is going to cause something big in your life. God will help us. So Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, reading from verse 28. Proverbs 16, 28. A forward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separated chief friends. Do you see that? Somebody, what do, who do we call a whisperer? You, you, you go to this person, have you heard? You go to another person, have you heard? See, you can separate. And it's just this little member God wants us to take care. So sin and sorrow through deadly level. We look at number two, safety and security through decisive living. Um, you can't some of some things you don't tolerate eh, because if you are sentimental, uh, you are going to get into trouble. We must watch out for any appearance of sin in our lives and church and purge it before it takes hold of us. For example, evil comparison can quickly swell to jealousy. When you begin to compare, eh, it can be bring jealousy. Addiction to social media could lead to slothfulness. It just, just one click. Uh, and the social media, they have already programmed it in such a way that as you are finishing one, before you finish it, the other is waiting for you. Uh, it's just 10 minutes. Uh, oh, this one is just 5 minutes. And before you know it, you don't amount to a heap of beans because you are just wasting your time. You are just wasting your life. And, and I should talk to myself. You should talk to yourself. What do you want to make out of your life? Some people, they think, uh, <laughs> they don't understand that whatever you sow, you will reap even if you are not conscious that you are sowing them. I don't know why my life is this. I, I, I just don't make progress. Well, <laughs> because you don't have time to think. You don't have time to, to look at the vision. You don't have time to, to reflect on your life. All the time is that maybe you even, maybe you even go to work. By the time you come back, uh, social media. So the people who are going to make progress, they are people who take life by the throat. And they, they tell themselves, I'm not just going to be... Uh, at the bottom of the ladder, I want to, to think carefully, what am I good at? What are the things God has given to me? What are the skills that, I have, uh, that God has invested in my life? And some people will say, well, I don't have anything. I don't have any skills. These are the lazy people. God
God has never created any man without anything. God has distributed to every man as God wants. So, but if you are so lazy that you don't want to find out what are you good at, what can you do, what are the opportunities around, what the only thing people say, everything, all the doors are closed to me. I don't know how to do that. In fact, in this place, I can't make progress here. In fact, I, I need to move to, to Afghanistan to make progress. If you get to Afghanistan, you are going to find another thing. They will not even allow you to enter the airport. So, what, what, what are you going to do? It's just, but they have time for the social media. You see, bro, what I like it is that you are, whenever I send a message, you respond immediately. You are always online. In fact, you are, you are sociable. They will praise you, but you will not make much progress because you are always online. And if you are always online, you, you know when you post, when they, you know what, there is another online thing, the hook and the bait. If the, if the fish is always online, you understand what I mean? Eventually, the fish will get out of the water. You have to make up your mind. Uh, some people immediately the phone rings, no matter what they are doing. Oh, my phone is ringing. Wait, wait. I tell them, say, <laughs> you know what I say? Well, if I miss it, if it is important, the person will call back. <laughs> I mean, if the person doesn't call back, oh, uh, I begin to shake. Uh, no, the phone is not going to determine ag my agenda. Uh, my agenda is going to determine the phone. You understand? And then they are hello. They, they, they are calling. And then they say, okay, uh, oh, who are you? Uh, we are Energy Mascapai. And then they still keep on talking. Energy uh, uh, they, they are working. And then they come and, and they, sometimes if I don't know, uh, uh, Ben Tumania, oh, oh, yo, okay, that Ben Nick, uh, good. Uh, I mean, uh, um, I don't think, well, you know, I'm not going to waste my time. You are selling, and I don't want to buy. And you keep on talking. You know what I do? There is that red button. Um, you, you don't have a chance. Uh, some people will still be saying, I, I, I click. I'm, I, I'm not ready to buy now. And, I think so, uh, maybe and then they will, before you know it, they persuade you to buy what you don't need. Little level. You, when do you cover it? Before it conceives. So if I know, what do I do? The only way I don't shut up immediately is I don't know who is calling. Eh, maybe it's somebody who wants to find church or something, so I don't. But what do I know, eh, is if I'm one or from Aeon or from uh, uh, marketing, eh, amen. amen. People in my house will say, well, you don't give people a chance. I don't. Mm -hmm. My time is useful. Other, sometimes it is, uh, the, the, you know, everybody wants, uh, uh, what do we call it now, uh, evaluation. Uh, have you, are they been sending to you? Oh, you have bought something from us. What was your experience? And I said, if you want evaluation, pay for it. <laughs> I don't have time for you. I will spend my time doing evaluation, the evaluation of this, evaluation of this, evaluation of that, and you are using it. I said, it will be good for them. I said, it will be good for them, but not at my time. At my cost. You want evaluation? Pay for it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Mm, some people don't like that. At least I will keep on doing it because it works for me. Maybe it doesn't work for you. Hallelujah. Amen. Gossip can lead to unfair judgment. Unkind thought about another person could lead to hatred. The best stage to kill a snake is in its egg form. Do you understand? Don't wait until the snake begins to chase you. When the egg is there, you know, so what, you know what some people will say? Hey, <laughs> snake egg. It's looking nice. Let it hatch. And when it's hatching, it doesn't hatch as a big snake. Oh, it's so nice. So nice. Snake. And you put it in your house. Oh, so cute. <laughs> Especially if you are using the Dutch language. Let it, 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 let it. Let it, let it, let it, so moony, so, so uh. it's a snake. A snake is a snake. You understand? Give it time. I don't. If you give it time, it will bite. It will bite its owner. And the person will die. So when you are, when something is being, maybe it is a kind of thought for, against your brother, against your, your partner or something, 
you flush. Do you don't know what they call flush? Huh? When you go to the to the we say, what do you do? You flush it out. And you maybe you are living with children at home and then you get to you want to use the we say and you get there, the thing is pink or something like that. They 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 are urinating inside and they didn't flush the thing. What do you do? They say, Oh, kill. I don't. <laughs> go get out of this place. That's the way to do it. You destroy that sin. Amen. Amen. So how do we do that? Practical. Everyone say practical. Practical. Uh Number one, watch out. Watch out. In Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I read from verse 6. Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and of the Sadducees. Look at verse 12. Then understood they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Number one thing, what do we do? Watch out. Watch out. Watch out. Number two, purge out. We have read that one from your life, from your family, from your church. Say, purge out the old leaven. Purge it out. You don't accommodate it. You don't tolerate it. Just purge it out by prayer, by the word of God, by, by the grace of God, by taking counsel. You just purge it out. Otherwise, that thing will destroy it. Some people are not making progress spiritually because worldliness has already come into their heart to stay. And the moment you begin to entertain, maybe it is even a member of the, another member of the church that is introducing you into it. Before you know it, you do not love the Bible anymore. You do not love the church anymore. You begin to say, well, in this our church, why are they even preaching like this? Ah, me, I go enjoy life. Oh, I would do that. Before, before you know it, you are gone. Spiritually, you are gone. You can't really do reasonable quiet time. And you say, I don't remember the church that is telling you. And you say, hey, in, in your, your church, hey, in, uh, you know, I don't, uh, me, oh, nobody is going to impose anything on me. I want to enjoy life. I will dress the way I like. I will talk the way I like. I will do the way I like. And they are introduced that thing to you, and you're already gone. You go to party with them. You go to all this uh, uh, severity with them. You do all these things with them, and your, your heart is cold. Your heart is weak. You are not fervent anymore, and then you begin to, uh, uh, they say, well, uh, maybe today it is uh, the association of Ghanaians that are playing. Uh, you go there. It's the association of uh, Igbo people that are playing. You go there. You say, ah, 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 if you don't join the unbelievers, how are you going to win them? And then, b- before you know it, you are, you are spiritually gone. You can't pray anymore. You can't be fervent anymore. And when you come to church, you sit down. The pastor is preaching. Your mind is criticizing. And you're saying, yeah, that's the way they normally preach. That's the only thing they know how to preach. They don't have love. We will see on the last day who had love. You understand what I'm talking about? And because your heart is weak, your heart is weary, the Bible says, Purge it out. If somebody is talking to you and is not bringing the word of God to you and the sentiment they are bringing, purge that person. Cut off from that individual. Number three, pluck out. Amen. Amen. The Bible doesn't give us a, an easy going way. It says pluck it out. In Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Reading from verse 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, keep it there. What does the Bible say? Pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right eye and offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Do you see it? It's so clear. He said, cut it off, pluck it out. And that member can be somebody as useful to you as your friend, as useful to you as your job. I says, pluck it out. And lastly, keep it out. You keep out. You keep out. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, are we together? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 
reading from verse 9 to verse 11. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. He says, well, the world is full of sinners. You need to go to the market. You need to go to job. You cannot avoid unbelievers everywhere. No, that's not what I'm saying. That's what he's saying. Look at now in verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother or a sister be a fornicator, do you understand now? Or covetous, or an idolater, or a ruler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. You cannot say, well, you know, I am understanding. I don't condemn anybody. Now, I don't judge anybody. The Bible, you cannot be more righteous than the Bible. If somebody that is called a believer, you know that person is an extortioner. Who is an extortioner? Somebody who, who is, 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 is extracting money unlawfully from other people. That person is committing fornication. That person has a wife, and then he is going to get married to another one. And the Bible says, don't, don't go with that individual. Look at Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. I read from verses 24 and 25. Make no friendship with an angry man. Did you hear that? And with a furious man, thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Somebody. Say, I'm not condemning anybody. The Bible says, and this person, he calls himself a Christian. She calls herself a Christian. Uh, and you are together. And she's furious. She's angry. And say, well, that's her witness. The Bible says don't go with that individual. You are going to learn the way of that individual. Amen. We keep that person out. So, how do we deal with it? Number one, watch out. Watch out. Watch out. Number two, punch out. Pudge out. Pudge out the, the level. Number three, pluck out. Just, just, just pluck. And you know what it means? He said, pluck your eye out. How easy is it? You will feel it. That's it. That, thing, that means it is going to take some violence. It's sometimes painful to cut off from somebody who is close to you because of this. But go ahead and do it. Because that's what God says you should do. That person might be your husband. Be your wife. It doesn't mean you are going to divorce, but if you know that your husband gossips, and your husband begins to gossip, or your wife gossips, or your, and your wife begins to gossip, and the thing is going on, and you have been joining because you say, No, my husband, I can't do this. Who are you? I taught you the Bible. It's true. But my conscience is not giving me peace. This one, I can't continue. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. And the last one. Keep out. Keep out. So keep out of your company. Said, no, I cannot go with an angry man. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lamp. Let's rise up to pray. I want you to commit yourself to God. And the Lord will help you. Um, at the beginning of the service, our sister read unto us, that we should not be hearers alone, but doers. Now you can pray and say, God, give me grace. I want to be a doer of your word. I want to do your word. Give me grace. Give me grace. Give me grace. Give me grace. Ask the Lord to help you. Let the coordinator please come and lead us shortly in prayer. I pray, my brethren, you have heard. Now it's time to consider the words you have heard. 
Consider what I say. Consider what you've heard. A little living. It will leaven the whole lump. What is the understanding you have received from God today? Take a step back. You've seen the living of sin itself. The living of pride, of fornication, of hypocrisy. And you've been told what to do with it. Purge it out. And not tell the Lord, Lord, here I am. No matter how small, it is deadly. It will bring sorrow. It will consume you. Ask the Lord, wherever and at what stage it might be, you can bring yourself before the Lord today and tell the Lord, Lord, take it out of me. I don't want to die. I don't want to be consumed. I don't want to be destroyed. Call upon the Lord. He is mighty to save whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord. That same person will be saved. And having received God's grace, we have a responsibility to watch We've learned today, watch out. Watch out. We've learned we should purge it out. We've learned we should keep it out. Where you are lacking in strength, the Bible tells us the Lord is able to strengthen us Ask for strength today, no matter how useful, no matter how profitable, no matter how important it might be, if it causes you to sin, the Bible says, pluck it out and cast it away from you. Don't keep it close. Don't pamper it. Don't excuse it. Don't rationalize don't minimize it. After all, I'm not the only one. God understands. No, we've heard the, the word of the Lord. Consider what I say. The Lord has spoken. What is the understanding you are living here with? Beyond information, what is the understanding you have of all that you've heard? Consider what I say. Lord, I don't want to be ignorant. I will not pamper sin. I will not pamper covetousness. I will not pamper lust. Anything that would engender strife, you nip it in the bud, you cut it off. Ask the Lord for grace to keep out, to watch out, to purge out. Tell the Lord, Lord, I want these words. Let, let the profit in, let it, let it be visible. I want to live here with this newfound understanding, the consciousness, the diligence. In the second point, it says safety, safety and security through decisive living. There will be times to make tough decisions, but Lord, we're asking, give us the grace. Let's be seated, please. We are grateful for your coming, and I pray um, 
the Lord will reward you abundantly in Jesus' name. Before we go, just a little thing. Let's open to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And we read from verse 15. We are one family together. Amen. Amen. So when one family is honored, what do we do? We honor that family. And when one family is suffering, we suffer. The Bible says in verse 15, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Um, Sister Felicia lost her mom, uh, and it's been very, very painful for her. Um, she has cried like a baby. And we have been with her in her pain. But the Lord is comforting her. Uh, the burial has been done. So we just want to uh, pray with her. She's in church today. She's leaving uh, on Tuesday uh, for her second uh, abode. Uh, we will pray for her. And before we pray for her, she, she wants to say thank you for the support. And I think it's good, you know, as members of the body. Uh, so please, let's, let's, let's give her the telephone, I mean, the, that, that microphone. You just walk up to the microphone, uh, and then uh, we will tell the church, uh, don't cry today. <laughs> uh, the, the cry is over. Uh, you will be comforted. Amen. Amen. So please, uh, please become a little bit prayer for her. Uh, Praise the Lord. Sister, maybe you just stand by uh, with her here. <laughs> sister, I know my sister. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you are together with the Lord. Yes, please, God bless you. Praise be to the Lord. Hallelujah. The most high God. I stand here with my brethren with my heart and the entire family back home, my father, and I say, God, thank you. Amen. We want to thank the Almighty for what he's done, especially me as a friend of my mother, a firstborn. When I heard my mother was passed on, I thought I could not, even though I'm a Christian, really, it was a shock to me, so I was just shaking every day. As my father was saying, I've been crying a lot. I really. If Christ can bring my mother's back, I know that he would come back. But then, what God wants is what he has done. It is the will of God. So I thank God for what he has done. Amen. My secondly is to my pastor in deeper life, Pastor Ujo. A pastor, a brother and a friend. I have to say a friend because a friend feels when another friend is on an emotion or is on another way around. I thank him very much. I have to say God bless him because thanks can never, I mean, add anything to him, but the blessings can uplift him in the name of Jesus. I thank him so much. I bless also my dear pastor, um, Kayode, Pastor Loko as my father. Mm. What can I say? God bless them all. Amen. The entire church. Sister Remy, after my, father, my mother death when I came, I said Sister Remy will be my mother, even though I may have grown up that name. But he's always with me. Sister, I can't mention all. All of you, my dear Sister Victoria, God bless you. God bless you all. Amen. I cannot say anymore. I don't want to cry, and I'm not crying, it's just emotionally. I've lost mama, but I know the church is there. Christ is there, and the church is my mother. So I know I'm with you all. I'm living here and going back there, but I know my heart, my soul is here to worship every day. God bless you for allowing me to say and share with you. 
Every day I say, God, thank you for what you have done. Amen. Amen. Well, please, just, just keep on saying there. Uh, we, we, we appreciate you and your coming uh, as a family together. And we pray that the Lord will bless you. Um, yeah, we know Sister Felicia. We have known her for a long time. She has known you for a long time. And I pray that this love, the Lord will compensate for the family. Amen. Uh, your joy will be full. Um, we are a family. Uh, God's family. Uh, whether you are here or when you return to your own churches, still remember we are one family together. And the presence of God will be with you. Uh, Jesus has sent us the Holy Ghost as our comfort. And he's able to comfort us in all things. That's the joy that believers have. And I pray all of us will be able to partake of that joy till the end in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise up and pray for them that the Lord Almighty, he will give them lasting consolation, lasting joy, that the Lord himself, whatever is gone out of them, the Lord will replenish. The Lord will give them his own presence. The Lord will be round about them in their situation, the Lord will just surround them uh, so that they also will be partakers of this lively hope that we have in Jesus, that we shall rise again. Uh, that the grace of God will keep them and the Lord will recompense them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Father, we are so grateful for today. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your care for us as a family. Lord, we give you glory because we know that there is a day coming in which we shall see everyone who has died in Christ. Lord, we pray with this comfort, you'll comfort our brethren in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray for the family, O oh Lord, that they will find you at this time. They will find your joy at this time. Amen. And they will be able to look beyond the present and look to that lively hope, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray you support them and take their sorrow away. Amen. We know we cannot bring back the person who has died because it's appointed unto every man who wants to die after judgment. But we know also that the Lord can be with us in our sorrow. We are praying, O oh Lord, that your joy will be their strength in Jesus' Amen. name. That they will be able to receive the comfort, the consolation that those who believe in Christ receive. Oh Lord, make it possible for them in Jesus' name. And as our sister will travel back to the UK, we pray that the presence of God will be with her. Amen. We give you all the glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you very much. We have come to the end of the service today. Please let's share together. There is some refreshment. Uh, the coordinator will come to um, take the roll call for our brethren who are online. God bless you and good afternoon. Praise the Lord. We've come to the end of our meeting for our brethren online. Please stay on till we take the roll call. And for those of us in the church, thank you for coming. Um, like we heard, there are some refreshments. So please stay around, interact, and yeah, check up on each other. Um, we go to the online roll call. Um, I'll start with Mama Regina. Good afternoon, Ma. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for connecting. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, thank uh. you. Um, Brother John, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Very fine, sir. Okay, thank you for connecting. Um, <laughs> Sister Belinda, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for connecting. Are you with the family? Yes. Okay. And your husband as well? Brother? Yeah. He's here. All right. Greetings to everyone. 
Thank you. Thank you. Mama Cecilia, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, ma. How are you doing? I'm a little bit uh, fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> the strength of the Lord uh, be upon you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Thank you. We would like to thank everyone again for connecting. Thank you for coming. We pray that the blessings of the Lord go with you the rest of this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and have a pleasant week. Thank you. God bless you.